Bill, I thought you were you would bring some books, but this is the book, very ominous cover. Uh, but um, this is the book that we're we'll focus our talk on today. So, um, by introduction, Bill has spent twenty one years as a strategist for investment banks, based mainly in Hong Kong. Um, actually, that's when I last remember meeting Bill when he was working for Nomura. Although I probably met you when you were working for Bankers Trust as well. Um, then, uh, he's, uh, uh, he's worked at leading think tanks, uh, mainly on national security issues. And, uh, for the past 11 years, he has been at Harvard. He has published nine books, including his first book, Asia's nuclear future back in, uh, 1976, which was the first volume, uh, anyone had published on the subject of nuclear proliferation and nuclear strategy in Asia. Uh, that book reflected in part his involvement in the issue of South Korean nuclear weapons programs. His most recent book, uh, North Korea Peace, Nuclear War, collects articles by many of the world's leading authorities on the North Korean nuclear problem. He has advised several Asian leaders at key moments of transition, including the successful effort to avert the execution of Kim Dae-jung in Korea in 1980, uh, Korea Aquino's successful effort to unseat Marcos in 1986, and the abortive creation of a provisional revo revolutionary government in Burma. <laughs> so uh, with that, Bill, why don't we... Um, uh, so one last thing, of course. Uh, Bill was educated in at Harvard and also at Yale, right? Right, okay, good. And you have your PhD from Harvard. So... Um, I'd really like Bill to explain, uh, you know, highlight various aspects of, of this book. Um, it, it covers a lot of ground. And I was thinking of, uh, it covers a lot of ground and, and the contributors um, are, are all over the spectrum. Um, at, at one end of the spectrum, I think you get contributors like uh, Sung Yoon Lee, you know, Tufts, um, and then the other end, you have people like Jung Yi Moon, an advisor to President Moon, and um, and maybe John Delory as well, who's over at uh, Yensei University. And everyone else seems to be somewhere in, be in between that, including uh, there's a I thought a very interesting chapter um, written by Ji Yong Jung and uh, Xing Xing Wang, uh, the Chinese perspective on this whole uh, problem. In fact, I think that was the longest chapter, but. Um, in reading all this, I was thinking uh, initially, it's kind of like that that uh, proverb where the, I think it's an Indian proverb where there's nine blind men and they're all feeling different parts of the elephant. And so their description of the elephant is like, it's like a tusk, it's like a tail, whatever. Um, it's not quite as chaotic as that, but uh, I think there are some underlying themes. But Bill, if you could, um, I was curious, like, how did you, what, like, what, what, prompted you to write this book and uh, how did you go about selecting the contributors? About a year ago uh, we became uh, I became very concerned that you know we'd gotten to the edge of nuclear war and you had the, the world, and especially Washington, are full of people who think they understand North Korea and have very, very strong opinions, uh, but don't know very much. And to me, one of the triggers was when Mike Pompeo, you know, Secretary of State, former Director of Central Intelligence, was referring to Kim Jong-un as Chairman Un. Uh, and so I went to some of my colleagues at Harvard and said, you know, this is how we get into trouble as Americans and citizens of the world. We didn't know anything about Korea before the Korean War, and we didn't know anything about Vietnam before the Vietnam War. And we have something to offer here. Uh, there are people out there who actually know something. And, uh, but uh, there was a problem that when you 
put a book out. A university publisher t typically takes two or three years. So I, I said, uh, I went to Graham Allison, my colleague at the Kennedy School, and, uh, in November. Uh, and he said, you know, it's all going to be over by March. It's a waste of time to do a book. So I went back to my colleague and said, I'm going to give everybody a deadline of four, uh, of four months. They get two months to write a chapter. And after four months, we're going to have a book out. Uh, coming from investment banks, uh, you know, we do a, a book overnight. Uh, and so I thought this is doable, but only if people understand. We're, we're talking about nuclear war here. Uh, oh, we got a book out in four months from the time I mailed the invitations. The other thing was we wanted to get all the major issues covered. Uh, verification of a deal. What kind of a deal? What kind of political pressures does Kim Jong-un have to confront? Uh, we got all the technical issues covered, and we wanted the whole spectrum of opinion. So you can find at least three chapters in the book which explain why everything I say today is nonsense. Um, and, and amazingly, uh, people responded. Um, and we really sought out people who knew. And for instance, uh, Tom mentioned the China chapter. He's a professor at Fudan, but before he was a professor, he was a PLA general staff signals intelligence guy. That's, yeah, that's uh, Yong Zhang? Uh, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so he was listening to the phone calls of the North Korean leaders for 19 years. He knows. Uh, so he can write very authoritatively, and you never find anything comparable about Chinese policies toward North Korea anyway. So that, that that's why we did it. And, and the great thing was people responded because university, many of them are university professors. They'd never seen a book brought out in four months before. And we, as a result, we had to publish it ourselves. So it's, it's basically available on Amazon. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was uh, I was struck reading the various chapters um, how how timely and up to date it is. So you, uh, you know, a wonderful job that you got this turned around so quickly and it's so so up to date. Um, where 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 should we, we we start? What what what? I mean, what's the first message or topic that that you would like to well, cover? Well, a couple things. One. Uh, why does North Korea get nuclear weapons? And, and there were there were three reasons. And one was that Kim Jong Un's a new young leader. He needs to establish his stature within North Korea, and this really helped. And the second was to get the world to pay attention to North Korea. You know, they're annoying, but when they leader of North Korea makes a big speech. Uh, the New York Times doesn't publish it, and, and nobody pays attention. Now they, now they pay attention. A and the third is defense. Uh, this is a country uh, with 2% of the economy of South Korea. 2%. Uh, it's an economy, as somebody this morning said, the, the size of Dayton, Ohio. Uh, so nuclear weapons are all they've got, and the the superpowers wish them ill. China's no friend. We'd like to see them gone. Japan hates them, and so on. Uh, so, the, but the, the, the the first two purposes have been served, and the third one is absolute. The, they will not give that up as long as it's their only defense. And uh, 
So their hope is to make the trade that South Korea uh, made. And when I was in the non-proliferation business, South Korea was a big problem. Uh, they were, their economy was much smaller than North Korea's. They looked helpless compared with North Korea. So the situation was just reversed. So they were just gangbusters to build nuclear weapons. And uh, Nixon told them, uh, if, if you build nuclear weapons, we take away diplomatic support, we take away all our economic aid programs, and we take away the military alliance. You will have nothing but nuclear weapons. And the South Koreans stopped for that reason, as the Taiwanese stopped. But uh, they had a program at the same time. But with the, North Korea, with the South Koreans, we kept talking to them and saying, you know, if there's a nuclear exchange on the Korean Peninsula, that's the end of Korean civilization. And this is the most nationalistic society on Earth. That really matters to them. So they took it to heart. The Taiwanese didn't take it to heart. They tried again in the early 80s, uh, and we had to stop them again. But South Korea has never tried again. Uh, so the deal that North Korea is looking for is basically the deal that uh, South Korea got. Um, and, but there are a lot more complications in, in getting there. I, I guess the second point that I'd emphasize is that we've got a new situation. If you go to Washington and talk to people, and Republicans or Democrats, it doesn't matter, Reminds me of the children's story about the flock of ducks that like to fly backwards because they want to see where they've been rather than where, where they're going. It's a very new situation. Uh, you've got a new young leader. He was educated in Switzerland. He has a little bit of an idea about how economies work. It's very different from his father and his grandfather who were just educated in Stalinist economics. And he's got a very different time horizon from his father because his father was quite sick. He could, he could have a terrible famine and a million people die and totally wreck the economy. He was going to make it through to his natural lifespan. Kim Jong-un has 40 years to look out. And he's not going to make it for even a fraction of that unless he cleans up the mess his dad left him. He has to get the economy going. And and he has made that... So he, he has changed the priorities from total military to a, a more emphasis on the economy. This is what this is what Park Chung Hee did when he came in in 1961. Uh, it's not as drastic in North Korea, but it's the same shift. Um, and against terrible resistance, the whole elite of North Korea has grown up on military first and terrific re resistance. And some of the senior people who've been shot may have gotten shot because they disagree so strongly with this, with this shift. In addition, he's made his, his own situation worse because he's allowed a, a limited opening of North Korean society from a very low base. But one example is if you went to North Korea a few years ago and found a North Korean professor that had American books that guy was headed for the gulag. His career was over. Today, you know, North Korea, and they're just trying to get as many American books as possible, and the leadership is encouraging that. And what that does, it bursts the bubble. Everybody in South Korea knows how bad their situation is 
compared to the outside world. And they know about strategies like the Chinese strategy that get a country out of that situation. So he's got to deliver. And he certainly has more than a year. Uh, he certainly has a lot less than 10 years. Or he's a dead man. So he has to trade nuclear weapons for economic development. And that's what that what creates the possibility of negotiation and a deal. Uh, I'll just add one more crucial point about that negotiation. Um, we don't trust North Korea. Our experiences with them have been awful. They play us. Um, so we say to them, you get rid of all your nuclear weapons, and then we'll take the sanctions off. And they say to us, okay, that will leave us completely defenseless. And you've been hoping for regime change and that we would go away. So we have a problem with that. And what Americans don't understand, by and large, is that we have been about as unreliable as North Korea has. Uh, I'll take just one example, the framework agreement of the 1990s. And we said, you let us put observers into your nuclear reactor, and we will give you a light water reactor for power, carefully monitored, and we'll give you fuel oil, and we'll exchange consular arrangements, and we'll have cultural exchanges. And immediately they allowed us to put inspectors in the nuclear reactor, and of the four things we promised, we did zero. And it wasn't just that we were reacting to North Korean bad behavior. I'll tell you a little story since John Bolton's been in the news. When John Bolton became Under Secretary of State for George W. Bush, he told his colleagues, my first priority is killing that framework deal with North Korea. At one point, the president, as a Republic, conservative Republican president, assigned Colin Powell to go to the Waldorf Astoria Hotel a few blocks from here and finalize a deal with the key North Korean negotiator. And next door, there was a very small group of people assigned to support Colin Powell. And John Bolton was part of that group, and he spent the every minute during that negotiation on the phone with Dick Cheney trying to come up with new demands the Americans could make to ensure that Colin Powell couldn't get a deal. And so the North Korean experience is you can't deal, you can't trust these Americans. And, and John Bolton went on to say the, the right model for North Korea is the Libyan model. Well, we all know what happened to Gaddafi when he gave up his nuclear weapons. And then we made a nuclear deal with Iran and we walked away from it. So the North Koreans say, you give us peace and then we'll give up our nuclear weapons. So if both sides take the view of their own hardliners, there's no negotiation possible. So all you can do is a quid pro quo, a small quid pro quo that, that's uh, okay for both sides, and you build some trust, and big deal, bigger deal, and build some more trust. And this is going to take 10 to 15 years. Uh, uh, and, and that disappoints all the hopes of, of both the people on the right in our country and the people on the left. Uh, uh, and it's so difficult and so risky that anybody who's really optimistic probably just hasn't thought it through. But my position would be that uh, when you're talking about the risk of nuclear war, you put all your time and your resources against any possibility 
of avoiding it. So I've talked too much. <laughs> okay. Well, you've given me a lot to um, uh, a couple of angles to to uh, to open up here. Um, what you said about if I can go back to um, uh, North Korea's got to for his long term survival for actually Kim Jong Un's long term survival, he has to have a a, um, a decent economy. Um, the the two Chinese authors, um, Ji Yong Jung and Xing Xing Wang, they note that um, North Korea needs to break itself from its old and extreme mentality of protecting of uh, uh, protecting security through the development of nuclear weapons. And furthermore, they say that only social and economic progress can guarantee state security. So forget about the Libya model. It's not really relevant. I mean, the nuclear weapons aren't going to guarantee state security in the long run. I personally think the Libya model is oversimplified by, um, uh, by Bolton and others because the first seven years after giving up nuclear weapons, Libya was doing really well. In fact, one credit rating agency gave it a mid-level investment grade rating uh, that quickly fell by the wayside after the Arab Spring. Um, <clears throat> so this is, this is coming from the guys who know probably North Korea best, right? Listening to the signals. And then if I can tie in uh, something that, um, okay, so North Korea, for, it, it, uh, for its long-term survival, uh, they need uh, economic reform. However, Andre Lonkoff, uh, in, in your book, he notes that uh, there's a reform process going on. And I think Jonathan and I did this paper on, uh, on North Korea, and we recognize that there is a reform process going on. But how do you characterize it? And Andre Lonkoff uh, characterizes this uh, reform without opening. So as we all know, China's reform was Gaiga Kaifang, so opening and reform. So you have... A reform process. Well, what is this reform process? Um, uh, the economy is actually heavy dollarized or run and beized, um, but it's a reform by stealth. So why is it why is it stealth? It's stealthy because, as Lankoff says, that well, the North Koreans can't come out and publish any of these reforms and announce that they're on a reform program because they've already the whole ideology of North Korea is that they have the perfect social and political system. So how could they? <laughs> How could they undermine that by saying, "Well, we really need we really need to reform it," and an open admission of of reform would prove to be ideologically disorienting and cause instability among the elites and even the common people. So it seems like North Korea has boxed itself in here. How how would you how can North Korea actually embark on reform while ensuring the uh, the survival of uh, of Kim Jong Un? Uh, one step at a time. Uh, you remember China in 93, 94 uh, faced this mm -hmm. same problem. So they announced that they were going to have a, a socialist market economy. Uh, so you, you, you bridge to the market, but, and, but you retain your, your basic ideological goal. And uh, in the North Korean case, they say, okay, we're going to allow local markets to flourish. We're going to keep them technically illegal. Uh, but it, it's a good thing. People's lives get better. Um, this is the way reform started in China, in, in, in Anhui province, the the peasants started taking back the land from their communes. And uh, the communes were the instrument of communist power. It's a peasant society. Everybody's a peasant. Everybody's uh, in one of these communes and they could, so they could control your job, your income, your location, uh, who you marry, what you are, what your haircut was. And but Deng Xiaoping looked at the consequences and they let it happen a little bit. And the results were so positive. He said, hey, uh, I'm going to take the risk, terrible risk from his point of view, of spreading this everywhere. And sure enough, the risk paid off because peasant incomes went up by a factor of six and the peasants 
supported the Communist Party, even without these total controls. By the way, Xi Jinping does not understand that. He's he's going backwards, and there's going to be a huge price to pay. Uh, so Kim Jong-un has started this process on the economic side, and he's... He's done the critical opening on the social political side. The bubble is burst. There's no going back. Uh, North Koreans expect to move toward being at least as well off as the worst other country in the world. Uh, and uh, I think Kim Jong un understands that very well. He, like Deng Xiaoping, he's up against tremendous resistance from the whole North Korean elite. Uh, plus, he has a problem that Deng Xiaoping didn't have, which is that he's moving away from his father and grandfather. Yeah. yeah. So it's it's tough, but but the Chinese have shown the way. Yeah, yeah. I yeah I, I think that's uh, yeah. So Mao was not Deng Xiaoping's father. <laughs> Um, and two years after Mao died, uh, Deng Xiaoping in the 11th Party Congress, the Third Plenum, announces the opening and reform policy in 1978. So China, just if I could talk a little more about this. So China, uh, yeah, started this reform from below process, this experimentation without the legitimization by the central government. But at the same time, it announced at the party congress that that we are starting a, a process of reform. Um, Andre, again, to go back to Andre Longkoff, um, what, what he says is that the problem is, so North Korea has done state enterprise accountability reform, um, agriculture reforms where the farmers can get more of their output and keep it, and so that provides the incentive for production, although it's not working all that well because North Korea is still food deprived. But... Um, the government's still not willing to even admit it's done these reforms in any public way through announcements at the at the Workers Party Congress, whatever it's called, or in in the um, in the in the local media. And um, the problem here is that if the government's unwilling to admit that it's managing this reform process, managing the country towards a market economy, and you know whatever way it's doing it, uh, if it's not willing to admit it and make it public it will have a problem creating the legal and institutional framework on which to root, to, to base reform. And so it, I don't see North Korea moving quite, uh, moving as the Chinese did, making that big step to make it public. We're doing things differently. We have the socialist market economy. It's, it's not as decisive, <laughs> but people know that he's allowing local markets to happen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, he has been very public about his expectation and promise that the economy is going to work differently and better. Uh, New Year's speech year before last, he actually apologized to the North Korean people that uh, he hadn't delivered as much as expected. Can you imagine his father or grandfather apologizing to the North Korean public for not having delivered on the economy? So uh, it's baby steps, but he's getting there. He's signaled that there's more. The key thing now is to deliver. And the local markets are delivering a bit. But uh, he has to start making a deal to trade nuclear program for economics if he's going to mm -hmm. deliver in a big way. And uh, the, the dilemma, uh, his dilemma is how much and what do I give up that's enough to make an economic difference but doesn't abandon my defenses and uh Trump Pompeo problem is how how do I give something to incentivize further progress 
without uh, giving up the tough sanctions game. Uh, you got a whole city full of people who think that they, <clears throat> that uh, just bludgeoning North Korea with more and more sanctions uh, is the only possible way. Uh, and that's the problem we have because you know, the, the Koreans are tough. They fought. They fought China for about six centuries and basically won. Um, they're not going to give up because of our economic sanctions. Uh, sanctions are useful to get things going. Um, in, in a way, that's our equivalent of, of uh, Kim Jong-un's problem because both are... Both the left and the right of our uh, public opinion, or our, our, our professional politicians' opinion, is pretty extreme on this. Uh, you see this on China policy. Uh, I was a governor of the American Chamber of Commerce in Hong Kong during uh, the whole period of WTO and Hong Kong's transition, and we used to fly in and testify in Congress, and you you deal with Richard Lugar and Bill Bradley and John Glenn and all these kind of reasonable centrist technocratic people who did calculations. And you had Nancy Pelosi on the left and some right-wing nut jobs, uh, uh, but you didn't have to worry too much about them. Uh, uh, Nancy Pelosi uh, basically called me a traitor for not wanting to take away MFN from China. Uh, and But now that whole center is gone and Nancy Pelosi starts to look like the reasonable one. Uh, and uh, Mitch McConnell is kind of the, uh, among the more reasonable of the Republicans. Uh, so we've got a we've got, we've got a terrible political problem. Along, uh, it's almost as serious as a, a whole establishment opposing the idea of serious negotiations with North Korea. It's the exact mirror image of Kim Jong Un's problem of the whole establishment opposing the shift of priorities. Okay. Well, what if we did have um, a, a, a strong and influential center? Um, would it would it still could it still pull it off? Um, Ezra Vogel wrote a chapter. It's one of the best ones because it's the shortest one. And he takes he's not a Korea hand, so he takes this Pan Asian look at look at um, North Korea. But he tells a story of how he's in Dandong, which is right across from. Shinwiji, which was supposed to be one of the new and uh, uh, the uh, special economic zones in North Korea. There's, there's many on paper, I think about two dozen, but only one that's semi-functional. That's the Najin Sunbong one on the Northeast. But at any rate, so he's there. He's looking at this empty, pretty much empty Shinwiji. And he, he, he makes the observation, but I think it ties in with a previous observation that somebody else made, maybe the or, the Chinese writers is that Nor one reason North Korea developed nuclear bombs because it had a fear of being absorbed, I guess, politically or geopolitically by its more powerful neighbors, whether that's China, Japan, even South Korea later on. Um, I don't know if the U.S. has any appetite for trying to uh, unify the peninsula again. Um, and then, but Ezra makes a point, well, North Korea doesn't want to reform because it has a fear of absorption. If they open up, the Chinese will come in and own everything. Or if they open up, the South Greens are going to come in and own everything, and they don't want that to happen. So you have this insecurity, this this fear of, of absorption, this psychological fear, maybe I'm reading too much into this, that inhibits or prevents reform. So if I can <laughs> repeat my question again, can is this the right way of looking at things? Or um, can, can how, how, how do you solve this problem? I think it is. I think it, it's exactly the great dilemma that North Korea faces. Uh, and 
the only answer is you do it step by step. And when China started reforming, even though it was great big on the map, uh, they had a real concern that our big companies would come in and just buy everything up. Uh, and that was a, a very real, reasonable concern. Uh, uh, so you do a sector at a time. Uh, uh, you allow a certain amount of ownership. You require joint ventures. Um, and uh, uh, hope that you can manage this. And, and it's a fraught process. And you have to think of North Korea and of Kim Jong-un in particular as putting life on the line with all this. Uh, you wouldn't want his job. Uh, he, 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 if he doesn't do anything, he's not going to make it through his 40 years. He just isn't. Uh, both the elite and the people will t eventually take him out. Uh, so he, he has to change change the priorities to the economy and his military absolutely hates that whole elite is opposed so he's risking his life and and he opens up socially and that's probably the biggest risk letting more chinese and more south koreans and even americans in uh their bubble is gone uh, and on the economic side, a misstep, and uh, they, they lose control of their economy. So uh, the, the way to understand why sometimes they move forward and move back and they promised no more ballistic missiles but or intercontinental missile tests but they 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 shoot off a couple small ones to show the generals yeah well, we've we've got your back uh, if you understand how insecure they are uh, for me this is another important theme the, uh, an awful lot of the Washington and Western media, uh, look at North Korea as if it were this giant tiger. Uh, <clears throat> got nuclear weapons. They're going to t there was a story even a year ago. A lot of senior people in Washington are saying, "Oh, uh, th their goal with the nuclear weapons is to take out South Korea." Well, there's an old nuclear weapons strategist. In a nuclear environment, nuclear weapons are only useful for defense. As soon as as soon as they shoot one, their country disappears. And everybody knows that. As soon as they make a threat, they put their country at risk mm -hmm. of disappearing. Uh, this is a very tiny animal trapped in the corner. And if you trap a, a, a tiny animal in the corner and keep going, boo, it does the only thing it can do, it bites. And oh, they're terrible, they bite. Uh, this is not, they're not a tiger, they're a mouse. Mice don't eat elephants. Uh, m mice can make nasty bites because that's all they can do. Uh, the, Kim Jong Un's position is incredibly precarious, and and Andrei Lenko's other ca chapter does a good job of conveying that he's got the Chinese, he's got the Americans, and he's got his own generals. Uh, and those are formidable opponents. Mm. 
Right. Well, uh, what you said about North Korea being a mice, uh, I won't name the president, but the former South Korean president, that's how he described North Korea. It's a rodent trapped in the corner. Anyway, it's time to have the, the Q&A. And um, I just would, if, uh, if North Korea were to embrace reform, uh, the common, the average citizen of Pyongyang would be having spending their weekends like we, our new photographic exhibit uh, that was just went up. We'll have our gallery talk in November. But I think that's called Better Days. It just shows that the average person in Seoul is how he spends, he or she spends his weekends. Uh, the ones who don't travel, that is to Paris for vacation or to the French Riviera. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Bill.